this morning's message, and, and I kind of came up with the title at the end, just trying to think of kind of how my message, what, what it was about. Mom, what made you like you are? I, I'll be honest with you. I, I, got, I might have gotten this even from my old pastor, but when it's Mother's Day, I like to preach Mother's Day pre messages. When it's Father's Day, I like to do that. You know? And a lot of times what I like to do is I like to um, find a character in the Bible to try to look at as a mother. So that's what I was kind of doing yesterday. I was praying. I was like, Lord, give me a mom that I can preach on, you know? And at some point in time, what I felt like came into my heart, and I was a little bit surprised, was Bathsheba, all right? And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But, you know, there's no doubt whenever we talk about mothers that there's some natural, uh, genetically placed by God himself nurturing, instinctual aspect to being a mother. I mean, we see it even in the, in the animal kingdom where mothers nurture their, their young, right? And, and so we know that to be true even in humanity, that God has placed a nurturing aspect in a mother towards her children. At the same time, we certainly also know that life experiences, at least for human beings... Help to mold. That's why I titled it, Mom, What Made You Like You Are. Life experiences help to mold the mother, the things that she's experienced, the things that she's faced, and how they've affected her uh, and, and her in the encounters of her life uh, play a role in how she manages her role as a mother, right? And so, like I said, as I prayed, the Lord put Bathsheba on my heart. And I have to tell you that I never really thought of Bathsheba in the role of a mother. I've preached on Mary before as the mother of Jesus. And last year, I think I preached on Hannah. You know, it's hard to beat Hannah, to be truthful. I mean, how do you find a more godly mother in the Bible than Hannah? I mean, her only desire, I mean, she's over there being persecuted by her husband who has another wife. And really, she, her womb is barren. She's crying out to God to give her a child because in that society, it was kind of like a stigma if you never had children. But what she prayed to the Lord was, just give me a child so that I can dedicate him back to you. And when she dedicated the Lord, it wasn't just like a little ceremony where we come up here and we lift the kid up, right? She gave the kid back to the Lord. And Eli raised that boy in the temple. And, you know, she'd just go visit him from time to time. And so you're not going to find much of a better mother than Hannah, you know, because she was just completely sold out to the Lord. And in the midst of her pain and her circumstance, she just kept crying out to God. And certainly there's something for us to learn from her. But I think the reality of it is, is that most of us, I'm talking about not just moms today, most of us as human beings, we don't always respond the way like a Hannah does. And even if we do now as Christians, praise God if we do, but even if we, if we do now, there was a time in our life before Christ where we did. And, you know, the problem with that is, is that many times we carry those griefs and those circumstances. I don't know about you, but there was a long time as a Christian that I carried burdens, burdens from my past, a cloud that hung over my head uh, that tried to remind me of who I was and where I had been and the failures. Right. And I just think that a lot of times those types of things happen to moms specifically. And, and maybe that's why the Lord would have me to preach on Bathsheba because her story is different. There's failure that's connected to her life. So I don't think that we can think a whole lot about her, but today, but last night I thought a lot about Bathsheba and, uh, you know, most of us, like I said, don't have the testimony of Hannah. Uh, and we may not feel the specific grief that, that Bathsheba possibly felt. I say possibly because the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what Bathsheba felt. We don't, we don't know. But if there was any grief that she felt, it was directly connected to her sin. The Bible does tell us a little bit about some of the grief she experienced, and she did experience grief. So I'm not just making it all up, but to get to the intricate details, you got to kind of wonder about your own life and the things that you've experienced. So we may not have specific griefs connected to the things that were related to her, but at the same time, because, because of her specific sin, but at the same time, I can tell you that each and every one of us, as we look backwards, after our children, while our children are still growing up, after our children are grown, whether we were unbelievers when they grew up, whether we were believers when they grew up, we will have regrets. There's going, I'm telling you, I did the best job that I thought that I could do with the help of the Lord. I asked for his wisdom. 
I asked for his grace and I tried my best. I mean, not just myself, but Danielle and, and I together tried our best to make the right decisions, right, for our children. And I, and I can tell you that I have legitimate regrets about decisions that I made that I just wish that I would have done it differently. It does, it, you know, it doesn't mean I didn't do nothing right, but I wish that I would have done them differently. And I just feel like that, that part of that story with Bathsheba is that her life had to have contained some regrets. You know, the story of David and Bathsheba intrigues me. The reason why it intrigues me so much is because when we hear the scripture that talks about the fact that David was a man after God's own heart, immediately what our mind rushes back to, and it's always been that way, and anytime you have a conversation with somebody about David, yeah, but I don't get it. What don't you get? The Bible says that David had a heart, that he was a man that had a heart after God. He loved the Lord. David fell into sin. And it wasn't just a little sin. It was a grievous sin. But guess what? The word of God says that David was a man after God's own heart. The truth of the matter is that people that love God fall into sin. It happens. People fall. It's not good. It's not God's will. It, we can live a victorious Christian life. Nevertheless, the men of God, women of God, falter and fail. But guess what? What we learned through the book of Galatians is, is that whenever you fail God, you're not falling away from grace. No, you, you frustrate grace and fall away from grace whenever you try to embrace a system of law and legalism in order to get freedom or in order to get forgiveness from your sin. That's right. Some type of form of religion. You know, you're going to read more Bible, go to church more, do this more, and that's what's going to forgive. No, no, no. You're not going to find freedom and liberty till you come to the realization that it's Jesus and what he did for you at the cross. And you bowing your knee to the will of God, the plan of God, then and only then can true repentance come. Then and only then can the burden be lifted. Hallelujah. Then and only then can restoration take place. Amen. Amen. And so we, we oftentimes think of that. How could God, did God say that about David? Because we ourselves never committed adultery or whatever the case. And so we look at David through our own mind and our own eyes and we say, hmm, I didn't do what David did. Well, guess what? David was a man after God's own heart. David never, according to the scripture, I mean, this is what I believe. He never went after false gods. He had a place in his heart. You know, the word of God says in the New Testament it says to sanctify the Lord God in your heart always. Sanctify, to separate, to have a special place. God has to have a special place in the heart of the believer. And in David's life, I believe that with all my heart, he had, a, there was a special place in his heart for the Lord. And when David came to the place of repentance, the Bible talks about the fact that he wrote a whole psalm about the thing. He wrote a whole psalm about this whole thing that happened, really two of them. In Psalm 51, he talks about God purging his heart, God creating in him a new heart. And, and he felt the remorse and the anguish that he had let God down. I'm talking a lot about David because he's the one that we typically talk about. But what about Bathsheba? You know, we don't hear a whole lot about her. I don't know that one time, I think it was even Scott had pointed out that even in Matthew, in the genealogy, it doesn't even mention her name. It mentions Rahab. It mentions Ruth. But it doesn't mention, it just says the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. That's how it mentions Bathsheba. But, but the reality of it is, is, is that Bathsheba has a story and a context within here, right? Some of the things that I was thinking of <laughs> that we really just don't know, but I was thinking about it. Was it common, and some things we do know, but was it common for a woman to bathe on top of a house like that back then? I, I don't know. I mean, I can tell you that what she did know, she did know that the king's palace was right there. I'm not trying to say that the girl knew or expected that David was going to see her bathing on the housetop. I don't know. I don't know what her reasoning was. Maybe it was a very common thing. Maybe, you know, whatever the case. But I do know this, that David definitely wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. The scripture is clear about that. The scripture says at a time when kings went off to war, David stayed at home. So the scripture is real clear. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. Now, I do believe that she probably knew he was still there. Everybody in the city knew that David was probably still in town, I would, I would venture to say. Whatever the case, I do know, we don't know the motives of either one of their hearts, but David saw her and he allowed his eyes to linger too long and then he goes and he sins for her. And it, whenever I think about it, there's no doubt in my mind that he's a greater fault. I mean, look, he's the man, he's the stronger vessel, he's the king, he's an authority over her. 
He was not supposed to do what he did. She doesn't even know really at first why it is that he's calling for her. I mean, I wouldn't expect. He's not going to send this messenger to tell her straight up the king wants to lie with you. But instead, she could be thinking, man, my husband's over there at war. He's on the battlefield. Maybe he's going to give me a report. Because when you read deeper into the story, you begin to realize that this was a, this was, this was a mess. Because this guy, and David asked, who is she? And whenever he found out, that's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Immediately, you know, he knew who Uriah was. The Bible teaches us that Uriah was one of his most noble fighters and warriors. He knew Uriah by name. Uriah wasn't just some foot soldier that was on the ground over there. No, Uriah was close to him in his inner circle and he was a mighty warrior. And so immediately, if nothing else, once David knew all of that, he should have shut the whole thing down. But no, she was too beautiful. And so he called for her. And we know the story. He lies with her. I just, the story intrigues me. And I know that you've heard the story before, but I'm going to remind you of the story before we get into the main points about Bathsheba's life, right? He lies with her and she gets pregnant. And the story goes on and we know that he tries to remedy the situation, right? What he does is, is he calls, because she gets pregnant, he calls Uriah home from the battlefield. And he, and he asks, and Uriah comes in and he eats with the king and then David says, okay, so now what you need to do is you need to just go ahead and go home to your wife and, you know, go spend some time with your wife, get yourself refreshed. Well, it doesn't say that he argued with David. It just says that he didn't do it and then he slept at the door with the rest of David's servants. Well, whenever David hears it and he questions him, his response is, listen, Joab, the general, is out there sleeping in a tent. The presence of the Lord is out there on the battlefield in a tent. And if you think that I'm going in to lie with my wife while all that's going on, you got another thing coming, king. Well, the king doesn't know, really know what to do because he's got himself in a debacle. You know, the, the best laid plans of mice and men. So what he does is he brings him in and puts some alcohol in him. Let's feed him and let's put some alcohol in him because then his inhibitions are going to go down. Because that's normally what happens, right? Whenever you begin to drink alcohol or you take substances that change the chemistry in your brain. I don't know about you, but they make me act a whole lot different than whenever I'm sober. And so let's get him liquored up a little bit and see what happens. So that's what ends up happening. They get put some alcohol in him. Guess what? Now you're right the head tight. He's a bigger man than I am. I'm just saying, like, you know, I, I know for a fact that's one of the reasons I don't drink. Call, you can call me an alcoholic, call me whatever you want. When I get liquor in me, I don't act the same. You're right. The Hittite said, you put all the liquor you want. I'm going back and sleep at this door with the servants. And so now David doesn't really know what to do. So the situation just gets worse. Now he takes pen to paper. He begins to write out a letter. And he writes on this letter, and this is what he's telling. And the letter is to Joab, his general. And he says, I want you to put Uriah where the fighting is fiercest. And whenever you have him in that predicament, I'm just kind of paraphrasing it. I want you to draw back from him so that he's killed. Premeditated murder. I've said it many times because I've taught this many times that in the law of God of the Old Testament, there were two sins that could not be forgiven through just a sacrificial offering. Adultery was one of them. You take the man, you take the woman, you bring them out and you stone them. The second one was premeditated murder. There were no sacrifices to be offered for that. That's why in Psalm 51, whenever David says, Lord, purge me with hyssop, what you don't realize is he's actually making a plea for the blood to be applied to him so that he could be forgiven because hyssop, see they, what David would have known as a young boy even was that they used hyssop to apply the blood on the doorpost for the Passover. Lord, purge me with hyssop. Paint the blood on the doorpost of my heart. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that they had committed a sin that was so grievous. He had now committed two sins that were so grievous. And so he strokes this letter. And like I know this just from studying the context and the history of the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, that a king or a leader would have a seal, a ring. And, and you've seen it in movies before. They would drop wax on there and they would seal it. So he seals the letter. I mean, it doesn't say that, but I know that's what he did. Because if not, you know, Uriah would have been too tempted to open it up and read it. He seals the letter and he puts it in Uriah's hands and he lets Uriah deliver it to General Joab. And so what ends up happening is, is that they go into battle and Joab does exactly what David asked him to do and puts him in the front. 
and then draws back Uriah the Hittite is killed. He tells the messenger, you go tell David what happened. And he says, as you're telling him the whole elements to the story, and he says, when you get to the end, and David gets real frustrated, because he's going to get, he's thinking in his mind, he's going to get frustrated. And, and, he, and he begins to ask you, why did you call, lead the army so close to the wall of the city? Don't you remember at such and such a time whenever we, whenever the army of Israel did that and that woman dropped that thing? I'm pretty, I'm kind of shooting from the hip here. She dropped that thing from the wall and killed so and so. Why were you so close to the wall of the city? Why did you bring my soldiers so close? Joab told, told the messenger, he said, when he says that, tell him, master. Uriah the Hittite was also killed. So the message is given to David that Uriah the Hittite was also killed. And the time frame takes place where now Bathsheba is alone. She, she has no husband. She's, she's not going to be taken care of. I mean, the right thing at this point in time seems like she needs to be taken care of. But let's not pretend and act like David's motives are pure. David's motives are wicked at this point in time. He's full of sin. But so he calls her to come and to be his wife. And she's now living in the house with the king. And she's pregnant with his child. But once the baby's born, the baby gets deathly sick, if you'll remember the story. And the Bible says that David lay on the floor in sackcloth and he wouldn't eat. He refused to fast. And then one day he, he heard the servants whispering. And he got up and he cleaned himself off and he anointed himself with oil. And then he went to sit down and he began to eat. And the servants were like, why? Whenever your baby, the baby was sick, you fasted and mourned. And now you hear the baby's dead. And or he had inquired first and found out. And, and now you get up and eat. He said, for I felt like as long as the baby was alive, that God may have mercy on me and God may have mercy on my baby. But now what do you want me to do? Call him back from the dead. And so... He began to, to move on with his life. One other interesting part of the story before we get into the points is the fact that Nathan the prophet comes to him. I kind of really like this part of the story. I mean, you know, God's something, right? One of the things that we talked about last week in the book of Judges, because we talked about Deborah the prophetess, and the fact that the one interesting thing about a prophet is that the prophet's mouth always spoke forth the word of God. So you can say whatever you want about a woman preacher in the modern church, but I'm here to tell you that God used women before and God's the same yesterday and today and forever to speak forth his word from a woman's mouth. Deborah the prophetess, that's what a prophet does. And Nathan the prophet came to speak the word of the Lord to David. And he asked David, he says, he tells him a story. And he says, you know, there was a wayfarer, like uh, in other words, a journeyman, a man that was on a journey who was he, he was prestigious. He was wealthy. And he's kind of like just coming through town. And I don't know if he had a connection. The Bible is not real clear on that. About this other, he had a connection to this rich man. And so whenever this rich, whenever the wayfarer, the journer comes to the rich man, he's going to spend the day or whatever. The rich man wants to put on a celebration for him, have like a little festivity, right? And he wants to make ready a kid is what the, the old King James calls it, which means get like a baby goat. And, and not, you know, not so much sacrifice, but skin it and clean it, get it ready and make a, have a goat barbecue, right? And, and feed this, this traveling man. Well, the rich man had herds of goats. It was really easy to just tell a servant, go out there and get that goat ready. But instead what he did was there was a neighbor that was nearby that had one little ewe lamb. A ewe lamb is like a little female Lamb, you can fit, fit, imagine it like all nice, soft, and cuddly. And this man loved that little ewe lamb so much, he raised that thing and he'd hold it close, and it was like a daughter to it almost. And what that man chose to do was instead of taking one of his own goats, he took the goat, the, the little ewe lamb from that man who only had that one thing. And David, I can imagine his face getting red because, you know, there's a part to David that wants to be right. He wants to be right for his people, you know, because, I mean, the Lord, he had a special connection to God. He had a special place in his heart. Don't think that people can't have sin in their life and still have a special place for the Lord and still desire to do things for God and know right from wrong. And David said, I can just imagine how red his face must have been. He's like, who did this? Because I'm going to take care of it. 
And Nathan tells him straight to his face, you are the one who is guilty. You're the one. You did it. You took this man's you land. And, you know, when this, so through all of this, you know, I, I kind of was thinking too, at this point, whenever this baby dies, I thought about Bathsheba. Because once again, I'm focused on a mama. I thought about Bathsheba and all of the things that have taken place now in this girl's life. She's over here taking a bath, whether whatever her intentions were, we just don't know. I mean, let's not assume that she did something wrong. We know David did something wrong, but she's over here taking a bath. She's called over there by the king. She gets impregnated by the king. The king turns around and he has her husband put to death. The Bible says she mourned the death of her husband. The word there in the Hebrew means to wail and to beat the breast. So there was some wailing, whatever the reasoning behind her wailing, because if it's because she loved her husband, because now her husband's gone, because she's grieving over her sin, whether all of it is interconnected and probably is, we don't really know, but we do know that she mourned the death of her husband. And then now, after all of that, the child that's born is now dead. What, what grief is going on in this woman's heart? What, what's taking place in her life? What must have, you know, she felt is what I began to think about. But God's going to bless her with a child. And a child that we know through the inference of Scripture, which just means basically looking at the evidence, a child that she would end up training in the word of the Lord. How do we know that? Look at Proverbs chapter 1. Verses 8 through 9. Because this child's name is Solomon. And, you know, many of you, if you've studied the Bible at all, you realize that Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. For the most part, every proverb in there comes from King Solomon. Some people even say that Lemuel, which is Proverbs 31, is another name that Bathsheba called Solomon. But there's differing opinions about that. But some people believe that Lemuel is also Solomon. And that whole thing, if that be the case, was written by Bathsheba. But look at Proverbs 1, 8 through 9. My son. Now, this is Solomon talking to his son after he's an adult. My son, hear the instruction of your father. Forsake, forsake not the law of your mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto your head and chains about your neck. Ornaments and, and chains were, were signs of prosperity and blessing in the, in the Israelite community. And what, the, what Solomon has learned is that he learned some instruction from his father David, but he also learned instruction from his mother Bathsheba. And he's trying to impart that same wisdom to his own son and saying, hey, don't forsake the things that that you're learning from your parents. Don't forsake the things that you learn from your mom. Obviously, in Solomon's life, Bathsheba spoke some things and trained him in some of the ways of the word of the Lord, and it stuck with him, and it made him to realize the importance of the mother of his mother's role in his life. The scripture goes on to say that David comforted his wife. So when she was going through all of these things, and we're going to read the scripture in a moment, but that David comforted his wife. And what it means is that, you know, he went into her and, and, and in the midst of the comforting, however that all went down, he lied with her and she became impregnated with Solomon. And I just started to believe that after all of the things, once again, I know that there's maybe a little bit of speculation, but I think you're all going to agree with me that after all of the things that she's been through, and all of the things that she's experienced and the death of her child, that when she became pregnant with Solomon, what a special time that was for her. What a special time of hope, right, that it, that it was for, for her after losing the, the, the child that she had before. And how much she must have loved and wanted to take special care of that child that she was now pregnant with. You know, I was just looking at a couple of scriptures about a mother's love. If you look at Titus 2, 4, the Apostle Paul wrote in the New Testament a letter to a young preacher named Titus. And this is what he told Titus. He said, in your instruction to the body of Christ, I want you to teach the young women to be sober. And now that doesn't mean it's not talking about alcohol, although alcohol and now in modern society, pain pills, too much Xanax, Depression medicine. I'm just being honest. Can I just be honest for Amen. a second? I'm not trying to listen. I'm not poking nobody in the eyeball. 
If you go to the doctor and you're on depression medicine, that's between you, your doctor, and the Lord. What I'm trying to say is don't lie to me and tell me that depression medicine doesn't change the chemistry in your brain and cause an escape or a venturing away from the reality where we live in the real world. Does that? Can we all agree on that? Come on, everybody. Give me a what? what? You're not raise your hand, but you know that it's got to be true. Then we get into other types of medications that numb. They basically numb the pain. The alcohol numbs the pain. I was listening on the radio. Everybody's talking about legalizing marijuana right now. This one old boy said, I think he might have even been a doctor. After Katrina took place, I was dealing with things. My mom was still sick over there. I was living in California. The doctor gave me a medical marijuana use for health purposes, and it helped me get through that time frame in my life. I'm not saying that people never venture down that road, but the point that I'm trying to make is, is that these things that we engage, that we bring into our lives, we do it. And there's, there's, there's not always addictions. Sometimes it's TV. Sometimes it's working out in the gym. Various things that we use to escape our reality, right? And, and, and instead of learning how to trust in the Lord, I'm preaching to the preacher. I'm just being real with you, okay? And I hope that it's okay that we're real with one another. But whenever Paul says to Titus, teach people to be sober, he's not just talking about not drinking alcohol, although what I just said all that for was to make the point that alcohol will prevent you from being sober because what the idea behind the word is, is that we're mentally acute. We're mentally aware of our surroundings and our circumstances and living for the Lord and living in the midst of an atmosphere where we're pleasing unto the Lord and we're doing the things of the Lord rather than being blinded by the ways of the world. Soberly minded towards the things of God. Right? And, and, and he says they need to be sober and that they need to learn how to love their husbands and they also need to learn how to love their children. That's what, that's what a mother, according to the Apostle Paul, according to the instruction of God, should do. She should be sober-minded. She should be aware of the things of God, not get caught up in the things of the world, because I'm telling you, that's the context. Sober. And, and she should love her husband, and she should, she should love her children. Now, we know that there's a whole lot that a man's supposed to be doing, too, and we'll get on him whenever we get to Father's Day, okay? There's an aspect to a mother's love that comforts and consoles. I'm about to use another scripture, Isaiah 66, 13. An aspect to a mother's love that comforts and consoles in times of distress. It's a kind of love that God uses to describe his own comfort for his children. Look at Isaiah 66, 13. It says, as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you and you shall be comforted. In Jerusalem. Now, we recently preached out of Isaiah, or Jeremiah. I mean, all, all these these two prophets are intertwined; their ministries interconnect. And what we learned whenever we talked about that was about the Babylonian captivity. You remember that? Israel's gone the wrong way. Israel's sinned against God. Now they find themselves in bondage. What the Lord's saying, though, is that he gives a word of comfort that even though you're in the midst of chaos, even though you're in the midst of a mess, even though everything going on around you is falling apart, I'm going to comfort you the way that a mother would comfort her children. In God's mind, the role of a mother is that she brings comfort and nurture to her children. Many times there's an aspect to him where he describes himself that way. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, how often I have longed to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks up under her wings to bring the nurture and the comfort of a mother. So listen, for Jerusalem at that time, they're going through chaotic times. And But what about in the milieu? That's a fancy healthcare word we use. It means environment. The milieu or the environment where a child is growing up. I'm just saying. I'm just being real. Poor mama did everything that she knew to do. I believe that. But it was a mess up in that house. It, because daddy was a mess. I'm just saying. I say it on the camera. My daddy knew it. <laughs> My daddy, he, he knew he was a mess. And 
You want to talk about, I, I, did I realize how much stress I was going through then? I'm just being real. Like, I got a, my story's a whole lot better than some people. And it ain't, you know what I'm saying? It ain't as bad as others. You get that. There, every time you meet somebody, I ain't over here trying to bellyache and cry about my childhood. You know, after I was in the, after the first rehab, I remember that they, at one point in time, I was in three of them. They, they told me at some point in time, son, you got to start taking, you got to take responsibility for your own actions. Boy, that was the best thing anybody ever told me, even if I got it in the wrong spot. And you know what? That stuck with me because I realized at some point in time, after the Lord got a hold of my heart, that I was trying to blame daddy for everything. Okay, daddy made some bad mistakes. Daddy made a chaotic environment for the child to be grown up in. But guess what? At some point in time, you got to stand up Amen. and take responsibility Amen. for your own life. Amen? Amen. And so what the point that I'm trying to make is, is that children, right, the comfort of a mother, even in the midst of chaotic times and things that are going on, uh, can bring peace into the life of, the, of her children. And that really brings me to my first point of motherhood, looking at Bathsheba's life. Point number one, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her, and she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. So the first point that I really wanted to make, it's really more spiritual than it is literal in this particular case, because the point is built off of Solomon's name. Solomon's name means peace. Bathsheba produced a child named peace. I know that, the, that a person really can't produce peace, that God's the one, and we've talked about that That's many right, times. Amen. Right. That it's faith in Christ and what he did at the cross that gives us righteousness, a right standing with God, that gives us access to the presence of God, that allows grace to flow in our life. And where there's grace, there's peace. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that in the midst of the home, a mother can work with God to allow peace to take place in the midst of the home and a place where there is chaos. A mother can help to create peace in the atmosphere for her children. Proverbs 31 speaks of the woman who has wisdom, right? Speaks of the woman that has wisdom. And you don't have to turn there, but Proverbs 15 says this about wisdom. Wisdom knows that a soft answer turns away wrath. Amen. Wisdom knows that a soft answer turns away wrath. Now, if you're just joining the church or if you hadn't been here very long, then you missed the times that I've preached this scripture before. And the way that I've always preached this scripture is somebody's got to shut up. And I'm not trying to say it always has to be the mom. I'm not trying to say it always has to be the woman. But somebody at some point in time, if the fight is going to stop, has to shut up. That's right. And if everybody's always trying to say, but I'm going to get the last word, then guess what? It ain't going to stop. And you know what it's going to do? It's going to escalate. And all I know to tell you is, is that if you're poisoned from one another, and especially if you've already tied the knot, you better get on your knees and ask the Lord to do a work in your heart. You understand what I'm trying to say? But somebody wanted to shut up. Wisdom says a soft answer turns away wrath. Now, I don't get it right all the time, but I'll tell you one thing. I have, I have employed that practice before. There's been times that I've been so angry, not even necessarily with a spouse, some people would say, actually, it might not be a bad sign if you're fighting. <laughs> At least you're talking to one another. But what I will say is this, is that there's been times before that I have been so angry and I could feel it broiling or boiling up on the inside of me. And instead, I did. I responded with a soft answer. And you know what? It's so, it works so much better. Amen. It works so much better than trying to be the competitor and win the fight, than trying to win the argument. And, you know, and it takes the grace of God. You will not, it's very seldom that you're going to do that in your own strength. Right. It, it takes the grace of God to respond that way. But that's what wisdom says. And I'll, let's look at the wisdom woman. It says in Proverbs 31 26 <laughs> that she opens her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue. Is the law of kindness. You know, wisdom, and, we, and I've taught on this before a couple of times, and I really like teaching about this, the concept of wisdom. The word itself means skillful. I imagine David would have rocked, hitting Goliath in the head, but it's skill with the word of God. 
it's not just worldly wisdom. That doesn't have anything to do with the book of Proverbs. It's the word of God. So skill has to do with practice. You can have knowledge of God, but until you begin to practice it in a practical, real-life setting, you're not becoming skillful with the use of the Word of God. So before you ever put it in you, you'll never be able to practice it in a real-life circumstance. But she's skillful. She has wisdom. She's learned through her knowledge of God and practicing knowledge in life how to respond to situations. This is an ongoing, lifelong process. Her response with her wisdom is kindness. It, it means that she promotes peace and, and she's merciful and loving. The contrast of the mother that would bring peace is this woman here, Proverbs 21 9. I always used to like this scripture. I'd throw it on somebody whenever, you know, things weren't going the way that I wanted them. Oh, I would, I'm a mess. I don't like it. It says it is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop. Than with a brawling woman in a white house. What it means is, you'd be better off just sticking yourself off in a little corner all by yourself than to live with a woman in the same habitation that don't stop. And the word brawling means to cause strife, prone to causing a fight. So you're in the midst of a house with a woman who won't stop, won't <coughs> not say the last word, has to win. And it's going to continue. I know, mamas, I'm beating y'all up a little bit if that's you, if you're the guilty one. But I know that the men do it too. But you got, sometimes just won't stop. And that's why I made the point so long ago. But why does it always have to be the woman? I'm not saying it always has to be the woman. I'm just saying somebody got to stop. It doesn't always have to be the man. Look, somebody got to be humble. Somebody needs to let the Lord humble them and stop. Before somebody gets strangled or something happens, maybe they need to take that off the day. We're not going around strangling people up there. But it's better to live in the corner of a house all by yourself. Can you imagine that? I mean, have you ever? I mean, I can. You, you can imagine that. People that really get on your nerves and just don't stop. How irritating that is. I know you can. So the fighting isn't only a strain on the marriage, but it creates an atmosphere of chaos where the children experience stress and strife. And that was point number one. She produced peace. And I know it was a playoff of his name, Solomon, which means peace. But nevertheless, the literal, trans the literal point that I'm trying to make is you get it. It can be chaos, but we, mamas need to, to work with the Lord to bring peace. Amen. Fathers need to work with the Lord to bring peace. All right. Point number two, a good home will dedicate their children to the Lord. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 25. So after he was born and after he was named Solomon, which means peace, it says, he sent by the hand of Nathan, the prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. So David, what David did was, is he said, hey, Nathan, we've got a son named Solomon. I want you to come bless him. Nathan, the prophet, comes to the house, lays his hand on the boy and says his name is Jedidiah. So Nathan had his own name for him. Jedidiah means beloved of Jehovah. The main point that I wanted to make here, what the point was, a good home will dedicate their children to the Lord. This is what, what I wanted to say. David and Bathsheba, their home, were concerned about having this boy accepted by God, having the prophet lay his hand on the child of God, for you and I in the New Testament, the idea is that we would dedicate our children to the Lord. When we say that, we're not just talking about having some ceremony where we just come up on the stage. Not that we've done a lot of baby dedications. We haven't had a whole lot of newborns. But you know what? We, we really, we've had some babies born and I don't know that we've dedicated them all. We need to dedicate them. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is dedication is really the parents stating we want to raise our children in the atmosphere, in the ways of the Lord. Right? It doesn't fix everything. There's still going to be sometimes chaos. There's still going to be sometimes a mess. But it's so helpful to the child when they're raised in a home where there's agreement on serving That's God. Right. That's right. Right? If there's division in that, then the atmosphere for there to be a place where they grow up to love God is hindered. Now, you can do everything that you want. I realize that. I mean, I hate to say it, but I'll say it on tape and we ain't even got to strike it. Sometimes I wonder. If something ever happened to me, would my, are my kids really, have they determined in their heart that they're really, 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 really going to serve the Lord? But And, I'm, and once again, I don't, I'm not saying I've done everything perfect to play it out before them, but I've certainly tried to teach them the ways of the Lord. When they show up to church, I just find nowadays people don't even really want it. I mean, I don't know. They want to go to the church down the road. 
maybe we need to do something different. I don't know no. what it is. Or maybe it's just an entertainment spirit and people, because the church is embracing the world, I don't want to get into all that. And they're making, you know, playing with people's felt needs and what they want. And then you get this big energy thing going, like I was trying to talk to you about this morning. It's like, oh yeah, man, this stuff's happening. This is like... Sunday after the weekend. Let's go do this. Look, we got fellowship. We got gatherings. We got all this other stuff. You get it. It's a social club. I'm not trying to be mad about it. It just is what it is. But for the most part, I don't think that people really are hungry to know God and to know the ways of God and to know the word of God. And sometimes I wonder, would they really serve the Lord? But you think that, do you think that it's going to be easier for them to serve the Lord if there's division between in the home between whether or not the Lord, the Lord should be served? No. It's going to cause more confusion. It's going to cause more of a mess Amen. in the child's life. That was number that was number 2. <laughs> that in a good home will dedicate their children to the Lord. Point number 3. Bathsheba respected the king and his word. Just bear with me. We're almost done. 1 Kings 1, 15 through 16. It says, And Bathsheba went in unto the king, into the chamber, and the king was very old, and Abishag the Shunammite ministered unto the king. And Bathsheba bowed and did obeisance unto the king, and the king said, What wouldest thou? So the context of this story is that David's getting old. He's about to die. Abishag, the Shunammite, this isn't a sexual thing going on if you read the story. She was a young virgin. She was used to actually lie in the bed for her body warmth to keep David warm, okay? Uh, he's at an age where he's near death. And so, but Bathsheba is going into the presence, right? I put Bathsheba respected the king and his word. She's going into the presence to get a word from David. But this point that I'm about to make, it's really both spiritual and literal. And what I mean by that is spiritual when I make the point that David is a type of Christ. Even in all of the failure that we just talked about earlier, there is no better type of Christ in the Old Testament than King David. The Bible says in the New Testament that Jesus will rule on the throne of David. David Jesus is the fulfillment of the type of king that David was intended to be. The shepherd king. He started off in a sheepfold. He became the king. Jesus is the great shepherd. Amen. You get the point. So David is a type of Christ. Bathsheba is a type of the bride. Us, the church. The church is supposed to be concerned about the will of God, the presence of God, to bow to their, her king, and to be concerned about the word that he would give. In other words, what does God's word say? What will the bride revere the word of the king? Now, from a literal point, it's not exactly the same because women then pretty much had to just obey their husbands. And in addition to that, and nowadays it, that's not the case. We, we, we get all that. And I'm not saying that it should be that way. It's kind of it's always kind of weird to me. And the word submission, and we, I'm not even using all that scripture today. I believe in that, but it's a submission to one another as you submit to the Lord. It's, a, it's not like I'm going to lord over you and you're going to do what I tell you, woman. It, that, that's just not right. I mean, I might have said that a time or two, <laughs> but, but it ain't right. I can tell you that right now. And I see all these women like, yeah, I really did. I'll put a knot on your head. But, but anyway, okay. <laughs> Times then were different. Plus... He's the king. All right, so that added a whole other level to his word. It was final. But the point that I'm really trying to make is that it's a good, a good mom would not only inquire to know what God would have to say, but she would also inquire to know what the father has to say. Now, sometimes I can tell you, I know I'm going longer than I expect, but there's been times whenever there have been moms that have come into the clinic, and this is just, this is just being real with you. Sometimes I'm raw. Sometimes I'm real. I haven't said this in a long time because I'm purposefully trying not to make people mad. But there's been times, and listen, if, if this hits you the wrong way, I'm not saying it to be mean. I'm just being real. There's been times that mamas have come in and all they've done is complained about the, the daddy of the baby. Every single time, da 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 bam 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 and one time twice I said this. I said, Well he wasn't too bad when you hopped in the sack with him and you had a baby with him. Somebody had to make the decision to have sex with this dude and to procreate with him. 
So it ain't all him. No matter how bad or jacked up this dude is, you chose to have sexual relations with him and to procreate and to make a child with this dude. Amen. Amen. So you need to take some responsibility, right, for your own actions. But what I am trying to say is this. That maybe, maybe he is that jacked up. And maybe he's just completely disconnected from the kid. But if he's not, then you then there should be some type of a partnership. And a good mom is not only going to ask the Lord. We're talking about Christian mamas today. I realize that. But sometimes we get in the habit. Another story. I was talking to this girl at the gym. And she was talking about how she finds that a lot of times women in the church are having a hard time learning how to be dependent and live alone and to trust the Lord and all of that. And instead, they find themselves seeking out relationships, and sometimes the relationships go wrong. Well, the Lord's already revealed that whenever you've lived a certain way all of your life and you've learned to be dependent upon a, a man, that's something that, that women in the church have a hard time letting go of. And I get all of that. Okay. They, they, they have a hard time letting go of that. Right? And But, but what I'm trying to say is, is this, is that whenever, but that's not the will of the Lord. It's not the will of the Lord if you're not in a marriage relationship or you're not it to, to continue on in that type of vein to be dependent upon a man to try to to try to figure all of all of that kind of stuff out. If you're going to if you're going to be in a relationship with, with a man, it needs to be a situation where you're going to figure out whether or not this is compatible for marriage. Right. And then when you enter into that marriage, guess what? This man is now part of your life. He's part of your children's life. And if they have a daddy that's part of their life, he's part of their life too. And so I believe that a woman of God should not only inquire about the, of the word from the Lord, but should also involve the father of the child. That was point number three. Hopefully I didn't make too much of a mess there. Mm -hmm. All right. This is the last point. She will make herself available to minister to her children's needs. First Kings 1, 17. And then we'll look at verse 28 through 30. It says, And she said unto him, in 1 Kings 1, 17, She said unto him, My Lord, thou swearest by the Lord thy God unto thine handmaid, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon your throne. Go to verse 28. So basically what she's saying is, Lord, Lord David, my, my husband, my Lord, my king, we've had this conversation before. You, you told me that Solomon was going to reign on the throne. Then King David answered and said, Call me Bathsheba. So some time's gone by. She came into the king's presence, stood before the king, and the king swore and said, As the Lord lives and has redeemed my soul out of all distress, even as I swear unto you by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly Solomon your son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead, even so will I certainly do this day. See, this was a turning point in Solomon's life. You know, if you don't read the whole context, you don't know what's going on. But what's happening is David's sick. David's getting old. David's about to die. And he appears weak to the people. And one of his other sons just established himself on the throne. He said, I'm going to take over. And now the word is going forth to David and explaining, hey, look, your other son is sitting on the throne. Is this what you're behind? And what Bathsheba's doing is she's going into the presence of the king to plead the cause of her son Solomon. The main point that I wanted to make here is that sometimes our children need us to plead their cause. Right. Sometimes I know that there have been times in my life as a child that the only person I ha felt like I had on my side was my mom. That's right. You know, now there's got to be a fine balance with that. I got to be honest with you. I don't I feel as though I probably was more the other way. And I'm closing with this concept right here. I think I was more the other way. I think that I expected because of what Jeremiah said, the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Like, I think I expected that something was up. They were being mischievous. And watch them out the backside corner of my eye. Everything that they're doing. And questioning them and grilling them. And investigating. And looking. You know? So, but there has to be a balance to that. Sometimes our children need us to go to bat for them. At the same time, I ain't gonna lie to you, dude. If I go to bat for you and you leave me hanging, flapping in the wind, whoo, I'm gonna be some kind of irritated. I mean, dude, that's one of the problems that you have whenever people lie. 
And I know that children tend to lie. The Bible says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child and the rod of correction will drive it far from him. And as far as I'm concerned, lying is foolishness. That's right. If you can't just be real with somebody and you got to sit there and, and hide it, dude, that's a mess. Now that you done hit it and I found that out, it just jacks everything up. It's like now I can't, I don't feel like I can trust or believe anything. And we've all done it, right? Yeah. But you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about my old friend. Hopefully he ain't watching the video. He knows who he is. Who you, everything that came out that boy's mouth was a lie. And, and sometimes whenever you're around people like that, it's like, oh, Lord, here we go again. Can't believe a word that comes out of this person's mouth. And, and that could be a mess. And so I guess I'm just trying to say that children... Bathsheba went into the presence of the king. She intervened for her child. It's very important that sometimes parents, mamas understand that they have to intervene for their ch children. They have to go before them. And you know what? Sometimes you might find a situation where your child has done wrong. Right? Still got to intervene for them. Right. Still got to be there for them. Amen. There's a time for correction. There's a time for discipline. But you know what? There's also a time for love. Amen. There's a time for that child to know, just like the Lord would do with you, just like the Lord would do with me. Amen. You messed up, Matt. But when it's all said and done, 